why are we talking about belly buttons? So uh, we're really interested in what lives on our skin, and so we need a place to sample to think about what's living on our skin. And we like belly buttons because they're kind of a, a nature reserve for what lives in your skin. Most people don't wash their belly buttons very often, and so we don't influence what grows there so much. Um, they're also just kind of weird, um, which just makes it a fun, and you know, science has lots of hard parts, and so to have some good fun parts mixed in too. We just need a place to sample, to think about what's going on in the skin in general, and so the belly button is an interesting place to sample. And then there are all, also all sorts of other little bits and pieces. Not too wet, it's not too dry, it's kind of in between, and so, and so it's our representative sample uh, of the skin of a human. Has anyone ever studied belly buttons before? Well, well, so we know lots about them in the context of birth, right? So they're this interesting point of our body that connects us to the story of humans going way back. And so we know lots about them in that context. But in terms of the ecology of belly buttons, we really don't know anything. We get to be like, you know, Lewis and Clark or, or you know, Captain Cook setting sail for remote islands, except that we get to do it without going anywhere. Before we started, we really didn't know anything about which species live in the belly button. And, and so the, even the very first data from the very first person tell us something new about what's going on um, with the ecology of this system. And, and so that makes it really neat because even very basic biology is interesting. So what is belly button biodiversity? Well, so, so biodiversity is a measure of how many kinds of things are living in one place or another. And so we think about biodiversity of rainforests, for example. And so in the, in the rainforest, we're talking about tree species and insect species and all the kinds of life and the, and the number of kinds of life, really. And as ecologists, we tend to think of having more kinds of life gives you more redundancy. And so if you lose one, the odds that somebody else can do your job are better. Um, having more kinds of life is also good sort of from a conservation perspective, but what does it mean in the context of the belly button? Well, we know that the, the things that live on our skin play all of these important roles, and, and the key one is probably as a first line of defense. If a pathogen shows up on your body, some really terrible species that means to eat you alive, the first thing it encounters is not, not your immune system, but in fact these microbes that live as a kind of layer on your body. Um, and so in that regard, we might imagine that having a, a, a diversity, a, a biodiversity, a richness of these species might help to defend against those bad species. The, uh, the odds that one of the species on you has the ability to kick the butt of this new species goes up as their diversity goes up. We, we can make that prediction. We don't know that at this point. But that's what we've been finding in a rainforest. Our immune systems need biodiversity. They need some kind of richness of life to make sense of the world. So the biodiversity on us really connects us to the broader world in lots of ways, in ways that really relate to our health and well-being, and that are also kind of funny. And so if you think about smells that people have, most of the odors of our body are produced by microbes. And so the biodiversity on our bodies has this other effect. You know, the stinky person next to you, they, they don't stink, their microbes stink. There are all these other effects of this biodiversity. Our first goal has really been to, to sample lots of belly buttons to understand why people differ, why the, the microbes in their skin differ. We, we know a lot about why our genes differ and how it is that you come to have one set of versions of genes and somebody else has this different, uh, these different versions, and we understand the inheritance of those genes. We don't understand the inheritance of our microbes, of the microbes in our skin. And so the first pass is really to understand why the microbes in one person differ from those in another and we just need a common sampling point, so we've used the belly button. So in the first batch of 60 people we looked at, we actually could not explain any of the differences among people in terms of which microbes they had. What we did find, though, is that there seemed to be two kinds of people in terms of their microbes. And so our next question is really to try to understand what, what distinguishes those two kinds of people. Is it their antibiotic use? Is, is it whether they're born C-section or vaginally? Is it something else? And we don't know. And so. That's kind of the next question. So we're looking at more belly buttons now to understand what accounts for these differences that almost certainly have differences in terms of the function of our immune system, our health and well-being. But we don't know. We don't have a general framework for understanding our microbes the way that we do for understanding our genes. So Brittany Hackett, who was an undergraduate student in our lab, wanted to make a Christmas card with samples of um, microbes from different people in the lab. And as we started to do that, it became clear that we were seeing more kinds of life on the people in the lab. And so we really had more lab biodiversity than we appreciated. We started to engage this question of what was going on, and for whatever reason, we started off with the belly button at that point. 
and, and it went from being kind of a fun lab project to a serious question when we realized that not only did we not know what was going on with these microbes, really nobody else did either. It started, um, uh, for the most part, from an undergraduate Christmas card project. You can only yourself see part of the story. And so that, for me, is one of the really fun parts, is that if you bring together the right kind of team, you can see much more collectively than you could on your own. Now, there's the old adage about the blind men encountering an elephant. Each one grabs one piece of the elephant and has no clue what they have, but they can sum their knowledge of the elephant and see the elephant. And so I think always with a collaboration that your hope is to be able to see the elephant a little bit better and, and, and to you know not pick really mean people, but sometimes that happens too. And I, I won't name names, but if you go on the webpage, you can probably find them. What made you choose to make the data set public? Isn't that usually kept private? We've had a long interest in involving the public in doing science, as do many people. And so there are lots of citizen science projects you can get involved with. You can go um, help identify butterflies. You can go listen for birds. But our, our general sense has become that much of the science that the public has most readily available is what we think of as the most boring part of doing science. And, and so you can count things, you can identify things in the field, and that's part of the story. But for us as scientists, one of the, the most fun parts is really starting to think about the ideas, testing the ideas, and you know, spinning around in your lab stool and trying to figure out what's going on. And so we're trying to figure out ways to, to, to involve the public in those fun parts of science. And, it really is part of the thrill of being a scientist that I can walk down the hall and see my colleagues figuring out cool stuff about how the world works. And so to the extent that we can involve the public in more of those steps um, it is really uh, fun for us. And so that's the hope, you know, that, that a group of people or an individual somewhere else sees the elephant better than us. Does the ecology of microbes and belly buttons relate to any other big ideas in ecology? The history of studying our body is mostly a medical history, right? And so when we study our bodies from a medical perspective, we'd like to isolate humans and st study ourselves with little reflection in, on our relationship with other species. The history of ecology is a history of studying species enmeshed in relationships with other species. And so ecologists have a long history of thinking about what happens when you have a thousand species working together or not working together. How can we can we create models for what we expect if you have two species that are competing for the same resource? What do you expect to see when you have a big disturbance, like a clear cut or somebody uses an antibiotic on their body? Ecologists have lots of predictions for what we should see in those scenarios. Medical researchers, by and large, do not, because by and large, the medical field is about dealing with things we think are bad, getting rid of those, and then hoping that the health of the host is then better. It's a neat scenario because we know a lot about the body from me medicine and anatomy and physiology. We know a lot about ecology from places like rainforests and coral reefs. And so we can sort of bring these two things together, which makes my job fun because I can think about coral reefs and I can think about things that are relevant to humans, and, and, you know, in the same sentence. And so it's like Theresa's peanut butter cup, um, except with no calories. The chocolate and the peanut butter, you know. <laughs>